Welcome to the final day of the A4S Summit. Today we're focusing on reporting and as many of the speakers have referred to, without the information to make decisions, we really can't make informed decisions. It goes without saying. And so reporting has a fundamental role to play. We've seen a lot of developments in the reporting landscape recently. And so I am delighted to welcome our first speaker, Ashley Ian Alder, the chairman of IOSCO, who can share with us some opening thoughts on what is happening in the world of reporting. Ashley, welcome to the A4S Summit. Uh, well, uh, thank you very much uh, for inviting me back to A4S, uh, although uh, this time around it's uh, unfortunately not uh, uh, within the splendor of Clarence House. It's, <laughs> it's virtual as uh, all of our interactions are these days, but hopefully that will uh, end uh, next year. Um, so uh, um, in sort of brief uh, uh, period I've got, a brief time I've got to talk about this, um, or introduce the topic of, uh, of reporting. Uh, firstly, um, I think let's get, let's get straight into it. Uh, I think uh, this year in particular um, has seen a huge acceleration in activity uh, around uh, climate finance in general and uh, the prospects around reporting in, in, in particular. And that I have no doubt that that's going to continue uh, into uh, next year in the run-up to uh, COP26 in particular. Um, some of the themes that I think we have detected, uh, well, both globally and also from our, my perspective, sitting in uh, an international financial centre in China, um, some of those themes are, some are familiar, some are new. I mean, I think there's no doubt uh, that COVID has broadly led to a greater awareness of the need to address uh, uh, risks that might be termed existential. And that obviously goes straight to the topic of climate change. Uh, these sort of risks, whether they're pandemic or climate change, which in many respects can be seen to be, uh, it's longer term and more serious, ultimately. Uh, these are not seen to be abstract and theoretical uh, to be ignored in the short term. Uh, the second point here is uh, embedded in the first point, really, which is that I think there is a recognition that climate change around sustainability is undoubtedly the most urgent uh, priority. Uh, but of course, social issues have also uh, gone up the agenda, uh, again, as a direct result of um, uh, some of the damaging effects of uh, COVID in particular, the damaging effects of lockdowns uh, on economies. Um, there is now, I think, an absolutely clear uh, recognition that climate-related risks um, uh, are sources of financial risk, uh, and that also uh, morphs into uh, uh, the potential for uh, climate risks becoming uh, systemic risks, uh, affecting the stability of the financial system as a whole. Um, uh, getting back to COVID, I think it's undoubtedly the case that the conversation around building back better and a green recovery. I think that's real. Um, and uh, we have seen uh, as uh, in that context, uh, in the sort of uh, in the sort of reinvigorated discussion, uh, the uh, countries as well as businesses um, uh, pushing uh, for uh, green recovery and in as part of that committing to net zero targets themselves, which leads to a an issue around um, uh, strategic, strategic pathways to achieve those uh, commitments, and getting to us, which in where we're, uh, you know, IOSCO as a group of securities regulators, uh, we of course can contribute to all of this, uh, mainly through promoting uh, transparency through better quality disclosure. Uh, so fundamentally, market participants have the information to enable them to, you know, direct capital. Uh, in in ways that take fully take into account uh, all the dimensions of um, uh, climate risk in particular, uh, uh, whether it's the dimension of financial risk, but also whether it's the dimension of uh, impact uh, on uh, the broader um, uh, environment uh, caused by various types of business activity. 
Now, in IOSCO, we established something called the um, Sustainable Finance Network uh, some time ago, back in the end of near the end of 2018. And back then, I think we identified themes that, again, uh, where there's been uh, now a lot of traction uh, and movement. One, of course, is the perennial problem of multiple and diverse uh, sustainability frameworks and standards. Second is lack of common definitions of sustainable activities. And the third, which is very important to us as, as regulators, is greenwashing. Uh, and particularly greenwashing around products uh, and around whether products are specific, such as you know green bonds and such like, or whether it's really at a kind of investment fund level. So that's, uh, that's kind of sets the scene. I think actually from a regulator's perspective, and I just want to go through, through this as briefly as I can, the, the basic policy framework or the building blocks of that framework are now pretty well established. Um, so you start at, you know, you start, if you start at the corporate and real economy level, you, uh, that's really all around uh, um, uh, financially material uh, risk disclosures and they cost coalesce of course around uh, the four TCFD pillars of recommended disclosures. Uh, I, I think the thing that we had or the topic we'd been struggling with as regulators is this kind of core problem of what do what does the prospect of mandatory disclosure look like in the context of uh, a, a style of disclosure or a type of disclosure that is essentially forward looking and this is when it comes to you know that dimension of double materiality which is financial risk uh, um, posed by climate change to businesses and business models uh, and i think this is where uh, the uh, the current consultation by the IFRS foundation and the convergence project from the five standard setters and actually only in the last couple of days there was an announcement that SASB and IIRC will merge around um, in, and uh, combine into a, a new uh, organization called the Value Reporting Foundation. All of that, I think, is really, really interesting because if you look at uh, uh, corporate level disclosure, and in particular in the listed world, much of it uh, obviously is around financial statements um, uh, articulated through um, uh, IFRS standards. So if, the, if there can be an analog of that uh, with a sustainable um, standards board within the IFRS world, I think that is a, a proposal that's well worth exploring. And it can, to an extent, it kind of partially answers this mandatory question. Um, and I think it actually it ticks some boxes. The, and the boxes it mainly ticks is, are, which are vital, are convergence. And of course, you know, there is now a, a, a private sector standard set of convergence project. The second is governance, really, really important. Standards do not have credibility unless they are created within a robust governance system. Uh, and IOSCO uh, chairs uh, something called the Monitoring Board, which oversees um, the public interest angle, or pu it, it exercises public interest oversight of the IFRS process. And so conceptually, that could also apply to uh, to um, a new standards board. So convergence, governance, and finally, in the future, the possibility of assurance. In other words, uh, in, the, in the financial statements world, that's around audits. Uh, could there be an equivalent uh, uh, mechanism? And there are some examples uh, uh, which are current, but it can be amped up so that we do have credible single standard audits. Um, uh, in this world. Of course, it's different because, again, we're still looking at scenario analysis and we're looking forward to statements, but nevertheless. So I think that is really, really uh, promising. Uh, the next uh, um, level really is um, is product level disclosures and labeling. Uh, and that, um, that area, among other things, does hinge on well-constructed, uh, globally applicable taxonomies. Uh, and I just point to one project that is uh, happening at the moment, which is the hunt uh, for a common ground uh, uh, taxonomy as between China and Europe, uh, which we are particularly interested in in Hong Kong, actually, as the basis on which we might uh, sort of short circuit the uh, 
uh, the, uh, the, the task of constructing our own taxonomy from scratch, although all taxonomies need a little bit of ad adaptation to local conditions, but nevertheless, we think that's, um, that's an important project. Um, and then finally, you know, at the asset manager uh, and well, mar at the market intermediary level, there's a lot being done there. We have, as regulators, we have a much greater uh, firmer handle on that level because, of course, we license and regulate very closely in market intermediaries. So, at, you know, at an asset manager level, we can certainly uh, and we are looking at um, standards around integrating um, uh, sustainable finance into their investment processes. Uh, there's a lot to unpack there. I don't have time to go into it, but nevertheless, that's important. And there's clearly also, as I mentioned earlier on, a greenwashing side to that as well. Um, and then also, and kind of on the uh, on the intermediary side, of course, there's the work that's been done by the central banks and globally at the NGFS level, which is to do with um, uh, looking at, uh, from a prudential perspective, looking at the... Uh, at uh, climate risks in bank and insurer balance sheets and stress testing that. And again, there's a lot going on there. So that, I think, is actually the framework, which is great, because I think we, we now know pretty much what we're doing. It's a question of filling in all the gaps, of which there are plenty. Um, and I guess what this conference is about, uh, to an extent, is uh, looking, you know, talking about where those gaps might be. They are great gaps, but I think landing on that framework and globalizing it is really, really important. Um, of course, one final thing I'd say really before handing back is that um, financial market regulators like us can only do so much. I mean, ultimately, um, uh, just as with the COVID recovery, a lot depends on governments as distinct from central banks and regulators. And this is all about, uh, to an extent, you know, uh, pushing on carbon pricing carbon taxes, you know, green subsidies, etc. the whole panoply of uh, government intervention. And of course, uh, I am quite interested in the fact that there has been a bit of a rejuvenation of interest in the long-standing topic of carbon pricing, cap and trade uh, schemes. They're growing very rapidly in China, where I am. Um, but also there's a project that has been launched, uh, I think, uh, led uh, amongst others by uh, Mark Carney and Bill Winters of Standard Chartered on uh, carbon offsets or carbon offset markets. Um, so, uh, and of course, you know, when it comes to the political decisions around this, it's very important and carbon pricing and such like, because that then drives uh, uh, increased transition risk, which then goes back to the disclosure point, you know, so it makes it even more important. So, um, with that, just to kind of summarize, I think the uh, the policy framework uh, around um, uh, sustainable finance, in particular climate fi finance, which is what I've concentrated on, is set. Uh, I think the challenges, uh, in particular, the longstanding one around consistency and reliability of disclosures are clear and agreed, and there's action there, as, as uh, which is clear. Uh, and I think also, I think the collaboration among central banks, securities regulators, and to an extent governments is actually getting a lot better uh, as we head towards uh, the next climate summit. So uh, with that, uh, I'll stop there. And I hope you have um, uh, an interesting uh, uh, discussion. Thank you very much. For the second part of today's discussion on reporting, I am delighted to be joined by two leaders from the sustainability reporting standard setting community. Janine Gilliot, who is the CEO of SASB, and also going to soon be the CEO of the Value Reporting Foundation, which is bringing together the International Integrated Reporting Council and SASB, the Sustainability Counting Standards Board. So welcome, Janine. Thank you and also Eric Hespenheide. So Eric is the chairman of GRI, which is the global reporting initiative setting sustainability reporting standards for many years. So welcome, Eric. Glad to be here. We are going to speak for the next 30 minutes or so, really digging into some of the trends around sustainability reporting. There's been a huge amount of activity 
in the last year. A lot of progress. Um, so I'm really looking forward to hearing from both of you. And to kick us off, I'd love to just get a brief introduction from both of you about the role that your organization plays in that sustainability reporting world. So Eric, if I can come to you first. Sure, thank you. And, and again, I appreciate uh, to being here, uh, Jessica. So from a GRI standpoint, I think uh, most people know that uh, GRI has been around since 1997 and has been a bit of a leader in, in trying to create the disclosure standards that allow for the transparency uh, with regard to how organizations are impacting society, economies, and and the environment, obviously. So, it's uh, you know we've we've uh, been at it a while. Uh, we now have the GRI standards, uh, having evolved from the the uh, guidelines uh, that uh, what we started with, uh, and uh, you know very much uh, you know have been at the forefront of of providing for this vehicle of transparency. Uh, for use by all stakeholders, uh, civil society, policymakers, and up through investors. Uh, so we're very, very happy and proud of the uh, the uh, the number. It remains largely a voluntary uh, activity, uh, although there are some jurisdictions around the world that have mandated GRI reporting, for instance, in some some instances. Great, thanks, Derek. Uh, Janine, how about you? How does SASB's work compare? Sure, so SASB's newer than GRI. At SASB, we'll celebrate our 10th anniversary next year. Um, and if th you think about uh, GRI as identifying the broad set of sustainability issues that could impact people, planet, or the economy, think of SASB as identifying the subset of those issues that impact enterprise value creation or um, what some people call financial materiality, some people call it in enterprise value creation, but at the end of the day, it's how do sustainability issues impact a company's financial performance? And so the SASB standards are designed for communication by companies to their investors. And the SASB and the GRI standards are complementary. And we see, um, and we'll talk about this a little bit more, Jessica, but there's been a ton of work this year on a comprehensive corporate reporting system. And we see the SASB and GRI standards as foundational elements of that comprehensive corporate reporting system. So yeah, I think it would be great to, to pick up on that point because the first thing, whether people are coming to this world afresh, um, but also for many who've been immersed in it, you keep on using this term alphabet soup. Um, there are a lot of four letter, three letter acronyms, um, more and more seem to appear all of the time. How does GRI and SASB work how is it complementary? Where might there be opportunities for greater collaboration? And then we can come on to some of the other the other letters in in that soup um, in a moment. But but particularly GRI and SASB. I don't know who wants to go first. Do you want to go, Eric, and then I'll jump in? Yeah. So that, that's fine. You know. So I think this. You know. I, I sort of don't like the alphabet soup analogy, but uh, I recognize why it's out there. Uh, you know. Certainly from a GRI standpoint, and I think also from a SASB standpoint, it isn't as confusing or crowded as many people think it is. Uh, you know, we can rattle off lots of initials, uh, but at the end of the day, you know, as, as was pointed out in the earlier part, you know, from a, from a standards setting standpoint and from a disclosures that people are using, organizations are using and investors are, are asking for, uh, there aren't that many. You know, it, it's really, it's really GRI and SASB. The IRC clearly plays a role, and I think we'll talk more about that uh, in a little bit. Uh, but I think the, you know, what what all of this activity this year and, and interest this year, I think is is really allowing both of our organizations to crystallize the messaging, if you will, as to what we represent and, and what we're trying to accomplish. Uh, and, and I think uh, that's allowing, and in fact, we have a joint project going on that uh, should be released later this month, or a communication piece that, that tries to clearly lay out, you know, this comparability that, uh, that Janine talked about and the, the way that companies are actually thinking about and using in a, in a very real world sense, GRI, 
disclosures and SASB disclosures to convey the complete picture, if you will, the details that uh, that investors might need uh, from a from a SASB standpoint, as well as the broad stroke of of what impact organizations are having on the planet. So I think so that that that'll be coming out, uh, and we're working closely on that. And and then I think you know we'll talk about the future in a bit. But you know that's yeah you know, that would be my summation of it is that it's 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 arguably not as confusing as some people might want it to be. Uh, or, or willfully think it is, uh, and and as a barrier to actually giving the transparency that that we're looking for. Yeah, and, and what I would add to that is, you know, the the collaboration work that that Eric referred to, and that we announced uh, jointly with GRI earlier this year. Um, the the earliest phase of that is what Eric referred to, which is publish a report demonstrating how the two standards are complementary. Right how companies actually are using the two standards together. You know, our long-term vision is to achieve interoperability between the standards. We call that interoperability with a vision that companies could capture data once and then reuse it for multiple purposes. Now, um, that is a bit of a heavy lift because we've got you know, 77 industry specific SASB standards, GRI has its 34 topic standards. So how do we do that heavy lift to achieve interoperability? But that's definitely our long-term vision. Um, I do wanna also build on what Eric said about, you know, why does this appear to be confusing? I think uh, one reason it's confusing, I think is that we actually really have a lot of different, what I call tribes. We have the corporate sustainability tribe, which has a certain language and a certain understanding of the purpose of sustainability disclosure. We have the investor tribe, we have the accounting tribe. <laughs> and um, I think what we, and, and we have the civil society. And I think what we're trying to do is to develop a common language and a common understanding across, let's face it, a lot of different groups of people who are often siloed. And what I'm most excited about a lot of the work we did this year uh, with the joint statement of intent from the standard setters and frameworks was we were really trying to establish a common language and a common visual that could unite you know, all of the different people who have historically cared about sustainability disclosure. Absolutely. And just one other thing that I would draw out there, I think as a as a company or indeed whether you're you're an investor or someone else, often you are being asked for information by multiple different organizations. And I think it can be easy to bundle together some of the index and rating providers with the standard setters with you know, um, where people sign up to specific commitments, whether it might be on something like deforestation or um, responsible business and lump everything together as, as reporting. And it's very easy to create a lot of different um, organizations in a single bucket. But once you start to unpick it, actually, as you've both highlighted, there's only a, a, a small number. Now, that's not to say there's not opportunities for more, um, no, but in terms of global standard setting, there's actually very few. Eric, you wanted to come in. Yeah, there. no, I just wanted to comment that that uh, along the lines of what Janine was just saying is that you know if we can agree on on definitions and terminology and and even metrics as as appropriate or as as makes sense uh, at a at a baseline level, there, look, there's always going to be additional questions that a rater or ranker will be interested in. Uh, and what we're trying to drive uh, collectively, I think, is the idea that let's pull from a from a base of a common set of these disclosures, and then to the extent that it's clear what the extended question is that somebody from a rating standpoint is going to ask, uh, and and so as try to try to as you say, you know, unpack it a bit so that there's a distinction between what is coming out of a standard setting at, uh, activity and the and the common metrics uh, and language of explaining that. Because I look, I think it'll always be, you know, this this extra secret sauce that a rater or ranker is gonna wanna know about in order to arrive at their rating and ranking. And I think that's appropriate. But what is challenging is that we're not yet pulling from a common base of data that is underlying all of these 
activities by the Raider and Rankers uh, and others that are participants. I also would say that there's always going to be room, I suspect, at a product level or even a service level for some greater specificity, uh, whether it be in forestry or fisheries or whatever it may be, that, it, that an industry group would say, well, in order to carry this label of certified, you name it, you know, there will be those regimes and, and they serve an important element in all of this. But again, as you said, it's, it's important to, to really focus on how can we make as common uh, and as useful as possible so that people can use these things for different purposes and then be very clear and transparent about the extension that they want to put onto it in terms of company, re, you know, responding to another, you know, a, a question, but based on the same data to begin with, as opposed to a new way of framing the data and then asking the question. Yeah, and Eric, let me build on that because that's such a good point. And I think part of this is we just need a common understanding of, of the ecosystem. And this is why we constantly use the financial accounting standards analogy because financial accounting standards and this whole ecosystem of data and analytics is very well understood. And so the example I always use is no one ever confuses an S&P credit rating with the IASB or the FASB. That just doesn't happen. <laughs> but people confuse uh, MSCI or a Sustainalytics rating with SASB or GRI all the time. So how do we how do we get this common understanding of the ecosystem so that we can move forward? And and a lot of the work we have done this year is to really try to accomplish that. Yeah, and the recent merger between or announcement of, of, of plans between the IRC and SASB. So the Integrated Reporting Council, clearly an organization a for us knows well, we, we set it up actually in, in, in collaboration and with support from GRI. Um, so can you, Janine, just say a few words about your vision for that merger? How does the, the integrated reporting framework fit in with the discussion we've just been having? Yeah, so so one of the things that, and Eric alluded to this, that I think is important to understand about this space is you have uh, what I would call principles-based frameworks and you have detailed standards. So principles-based frameworks provide high-level guidance and the detailed standards provide metrics. So to the, the most commonly referred to principles-based frameworks are the IR framework and TCFD to some extent. And then SASB and GRI, both are more uh, you know, detailed disclosure topic and metric oriented. And so frameworks and standards fit very, very nicely together. And one of the things that drove the merger, the IIRC SASB merger announcement is that um, the SASB standards and the IR framework fit together very nicely. IR has six capitals, SASB has five dimensions of sustainability. They are very, very similar. And then the organizations have similar conceptual underpinnings, which is how do you provide a broader information set that provides insight into long-term drivers of enterprise value and especially intangible value. So all of the work we've done this year um, and I keep plugging the joint statement of intent, but definitely encourage everyone to read the joint statement of intent that the five, we call the group of five frameworks and standard setters published to try to lay out what the landscape looks like. Um, the work we did this year really illustrated that the three things that most logically group together because they have similar conceptual underpinnings are IIRC and SASB and um, CDSB actually, which we can talk about a little later. Uh, but, but we're trying, we see the IIRC SASB merger as a major step towards a more coherent and cohesive system. Yeah. If I could just say one thing, you know, uh, Janine is that from a GRI standpoint, our universal standards are our framework, uh, if you will. Yeah. And then the topical standards are are more akin to the 77 industry standards you have. But we do have a, a framework that is laid out in our in our universal standards. I just want to. Yeah, that's a good point. point. That's yeah. a good point. Yeah. And to pick up on your analogy, Janine, I think I've always likened it to the management commentary or in, in US terms, MDNA versus the 
the back half, the financial accounts and the, the standards that go with them. There's that narrative disclosure that's very important around direction, strategy. And as you've highlighted there, Eric, some of some of the GRI standards also pick up on that um, overarching information set that is needed to understand the context and put any more detailed information around metrics in, in, in context so that, that it actually has some meaning. Okay. Correct. Correct. I'd like to come on to one of the things that there has been a lot of discussion around, and that's um, stakeholders, a stakeholder centric view of the world versus a value creation enterprise value view of the world. And Janine, you touched on this a little bit in your opening remarks, as Eric did you. Um, now, a lot of the focus that we see, whether it's from the investment community or companies, is moving much more towards a recognition that it's a messy world out there. A lot of issues are interconnected and there aren't these simple divides. And indeed, if I think of our asset owners network of, of pension funds, they're increasingly responding to their demands from their beneficiary community who want, yes, financial security, but they also want to know the value and the impact that their investments are having. So I'd like to come to both of you just to unpick that a little bit of how do you see the, those questions around materiality, impact, the fact that there aren't neat line, clean lines fitting into the work that you both do and how you could really be working together around some of these issues. So maybe Eric, if I come to you first and then Ginny. Uh, sure, so I, I'll, I'll take some exception to the way you framed it in terms of you know, the, uh, the, the stakeholder versus the financial uh, value create. It's not versus, it's, it's both uh, and both perspectives are critically important to you know chaining our uh, sustainable future for for all of us uh, and so on the one hand we need that big picture we need to understand from a multi-stakeholder approach from a civil society approach from a community's uh, uh, approach you know what is happening to us uh, and and how do we get to the transparency to understand whether it's governments or companies or you know what what is impacting us uh, you know as as society and so that big picture is critical to understand what are the systemic risks, what are we stepping into collectively that individually we, may, we might not see, but uh, when we report and under, have an understanding of, of overall impact, you know, this becomes systemic risk. So, so that stakeholder perspective, I think, is, is critically important. And, and, and we need to emphasize that companies have responsibilities. I think we all recognize that. In, in terms of how they conduct themselves. Uh, and so that, that broad perspective is important, but equally important is, okay, if, if I'm going to be an investor and I wanna drive behavior in a particular direction, you know, based on not just financial returns anymore, but on what are these companies doing uh, to the society and so on, and how does that translate into action that they can take uh, inside the company. So both perspectives are, are important and I would say equally important uh, because we can't just we can't just drive off of what's important from a financial return standpoint or even the, just from a company per individual company standpoint, but it's really important to have that transparency and this is where that stakeholder perspective you know becomes and stakeholder capitalism, if you will, uh, is really trying to marry those two perspectives, I think so. Yeah, and I would just echo what what Eric says. I think this is a both and, not an either or. And it does worry me that you know I I'm hearing this narrative that those two perspectives are in conflict somehow. Because to me, um, they should be completely additive. And all of the work we've tried to do this year is really say both of those perspectives are equally additive. I mean, are equally important. I do think there's a fear that somehow the enterprise value creation, because it tends to be what the CFOs in organizations focus on, 
that somehow that becomes more important and it puts the stakeholder impact perspective somehow at risk. And I just think that's a counterproductive conversation. Um, and so what we're really trying to do is say, it's not either or, it's both and, and they're both equally important. And I think the most um, sophisticated uh, companies are, they, they absolutely recognize that, right? And the directors recognize that they're operating in a very complex environment where they have to manage both of those perspectives. Yeah. And I have to say, if you listen to any of the CFOs we've had speaking over the summit or those involved in our CFO leadership network, you definitely don't hear them talking about a, a narrow perspective. They are very well versed in the impacts their organizations have on the world and their personal and commercial imperative to respond from that perspective. But one of the concerns that I do hear, I, I agree, Eric, I agree. So I would I would hope that there has been some some evolution. Um, the what what I do hear though is, and this comes back to, to some of the points you were both just touching on there, is concern from some people that um, you have had more and more investors, for example, calling specifically for SASB and TCFD adoption. And then as which we'll come on to in a moment, the IFRS Foundation consultation, what will that mean for the kind of disclosures that companies are already doing through GRI and that that broader impact perspective. So Eric, do you think that there is a risk that companies will stop doing that broader stakeholder driven reporting? Well, yeah, you know, certainly there is that risk, uh, and and you know we've heard the same sorts of conversations that Janine alluded to that 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 will cause or could cause some companies to to focus on that, particularly you know as as we move down this this uh, pathway of of purely voluntary disclosure to some form of mandatory disclosure, uh, particularly if it if it comes through from an IFRS or from a financial reporting uh, perspective. You know, clearly, if somebody's mandated to do it, they'll do it, and then they they and then if it's voluntary, then they can say, well, it's a choice I could or could do it. You know, it depends on depends on the framing. So there is that risk. I think the other the other aspect that I wanted to bring in is that there are a large number of well-meaning companies and companies that are being very transparent. You know, they number into the thousands. You know, the number of GRI reporters around the world. The the challenge with that statement, however, is there are tens of thousands of companies that aren't. Um, and and even the reach of the uh, you know from a public uh, public uh, company standpoint, uh, there's a lot of private companies. And so you know one of the things that that we hope will come through in all of this is that it is equally important, uh, and we need to continue to drive that information need that directors in particular need to have in order to make the appropriate decisions about the economic future of the company. And the impact it's having on society uh, generally. So it's a, it, it, it's it's a tough. It's hard to say that that will happen. Uh, but there are certainly uh, are concerns that if they there's an overemphasis uh, and an only an emphasis on additional or improved financial reporting, um, and to make sure it's taking into account the risks to value creation, that. The rest says, okay, well, that's that's okay, but it's not that important. And and I would submit it's it's equally as important. Yeah, and I would I would say, I mean, the way I think about this, and and you know, we all live in a bubble, right? And so I think definitely, and Jessica, your C CFOs, no question, are some of the more most forward thinking CFOs out there. But you know, I still talk to a lot of chief accounting officers and a lot of portfolio managers and a lot of directors for whom this whole concept of sustainability or ESG is totally new. And so the way I think about this is how do we expand the universe of people who are talking about these issues? and talking about them through the lens of enterprise value and financial performance is an incredibly powerful tool to bring new people into this conversation. And that in fact is what I think has happened. I mean, there is no question that the mainstream investors, all the, the huge investors who have really started to talk 
significantly about ESG integration in the last few years have come to this conversation through the lens of financial risk, financial return, and long-term financial performance. So again, I don't think this is an either or. I think this is a, I, I'm a big believer in if you're trying to achieve big, hairy goals, the way you do that is by using every tool at your disposal and by using tools that resonate with the audience you're trying to reach. And so that's again, why I think this isn't an either or. I think different tools work with different audiences. And I think the enterprise value lens is the lens that brings, you know, a whole new group of people to this conversation. Great, no, I couldn't agree more. Um, I'd like to just pick up on the, the broader landscape. So we've touched on it a little bit in the discussion, but to get both of your perspectives around the future, um, IFRS consultation first. So the IFRS Foundation is consulting on setting up a sustainability standards board. Um, how do you see that work, if it does come to pass, impacting Janine, particularly from your perspective, because of course there's potentially a high degree of um, overlap or connection between the focus that you have been talking to and where the IFRS Foundation might land. Yeah, so I I say the IFRS, and I started my career as an accountant, just so everyone knows, and actually as a technical accountant, I spent four years in accounting policy at B of A, okay? <laughs> so commenting to accounting standard setters. So I understand the accounting standard setting world pretty well. Um, I think this is the biggest development in uh, accounting standard setting, the IFRS Foundation consultation is the biggest development in accounting standard setting in decades. I think it's a very, very significant consultation and that they would even consider playing a role in sustainability disclosure um, is just something I, I wouldn't have expected to see for another 10 or 20 years. So just encourage everyone listening to look at the consultation. Um, I do think what they've proposed, so uh, is to create a sustainability standards board, which would be a parallel board to the IASB with a focus on the investor user and on, uh, or providers of financial capital and, um, a materiality definition that's oriented around enterprise value. We agree with that. We think it's way too far of a stretch for the IFRS Foundation to think about going to multi-stakeholder reporting. Um, and then we've said, and and we'll say this in our comment letter, that you know the Value Reporting Foundation um, really looks forward to being um, a resource as necessary or as could be helpful for the trustees, but they need to first make the decision about do they want to play a role at all. The other thing we'll say uh, very clearly in our comment letter is that uh, they do need to commit to the interoperability with standards focused on broader uh, stakeholder impact. So the, the work that GRI and SASB have been talking about um, something under the IFRS foundation has to maintain that same kind of commitment or it becomes just too confusing for preparers. So that's, and, and our comment letter will be out next week if anyone's interested. Fantastic. And Eric, did you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I, I do. I think, uh, you know, we, we also applaud the idea that the IFRS uh, foundation is taking it seriously in terms of what are the the uh, financial impacts currently and, and potentially uh, in, in terms of how to cause companies to report uh, in, a, in a more consistent and standardized way. You know, whether it takes uh, creating a new standards board uh, under the IFRS umbrella or not, you know, I think is, is one of their questions, I think. Uh, is it an expansion of what they have on the ISB? Is it a new board? Is there a necessity for that? I think the other uh, part that we'll raise in, in our comment letter, which also we hope to be out next week, is, is exactly what Jeanine said, is 
is if, if you're going to do this, then you really need to give some thought, very early thought, to how do you how do you connect to you know what GRI is currently doing or if some entity in the future is is looking at a broader sustainability topics than than what we have at the GSSB currently is critically important. So uh, and and the other thing I would say is that while I understand the the desire to initially address climate, uh, we need to make sure that whatever they stand up is fit for purpose to address the whole range of, of sustainability issues, the whole ES and G, if you will, because uh, there is some concern that we, if, if we narrow it too much to the environment or particular aspect of the environment on the front end, would it lock in, you know, some some approaches and some some processes that will make it more difficult in the future to expand it to the other important issues that are facing the, the planet, society, and sustainable development generally. Yeah, and we've, we've of course seen some of those issues really um, coming to the fore over this year around whether it's diversity and inclusion or indeed the, the connection. So something like the just transition, how do you both transition to net zero, but in a way that creates jobs and, and supports livelihoods? I'd like to ask two more questions before we will definitely be out of time. The first one is around the EU. So I don't know whether either of you has any comments around the EU's proposed work to, to come up with European standards. Well, you know, so yeah, it's difficult to have a view because they're still in the process of trying to sort out uh, necessarily what, what they would uh, alter in the uh, in the NFR, NFRD now. But but I think, uh, you know, the bringing forward in their, in their consultations and in their deliberations, you know, this concept of this double materiality, and we can debate whether that's a good terminology or not, but it it, it does highlight the, you know, what, what Janine and I have been talking about, which is impacts on companies and companies impact on the world. And so uh, as as that uh, conversation uh, matures and, and the, IF, or the uh, EU continues their consultation, I think uh, what worry many of us uh, is that if, if there is a only a regional solution, uh, is that going to actually help the world? Uh, and so one of the things that, that, that we've fed back to them is that they clearly need to be cognizant of the impact of what they would do from an EU perspective has global ramifications. Uh, and, and so uh, in, in dialoguing, you know, whether they, you could say they want to lead the world or the world, you know, we end up with two versions, which is, clearly not in anyone's best interest. So I think, uh, you know, our dialogue with them is continuing. You know, they've asked us for a variety, as I'm sure they've asked uh, SASB and others, you know, for how you structured, what are you trying to address? You know, all those conversations are, are continuing. And I think there's, uh, it, it's pretty clear that they, they mean the uh, European Union, you know, wants to have something that will allow them to monitor and, and understand what progress they're making on their green deal. I mean, if they're gonna throw trillions into altering the economies uh, of their countries uh, and the underlying businesses in them, then clearly they're looking for some mechanism to be able to track that and measure, are we making progress? Uh, and that needs to be done. Uh, the question is whether it needs to be done in a purely European context uh, and then see what happens with the rest of the world or whether we can you know, come together now uh, and agree on what are the individual elements that they need to have the information for to track their progress uh, that would build on what already is in existence uh, from a global standpoint or, or will be put up into existence on a global standpoint. Yeah, because those are definitely questions that many other governments yeah. and indeed investors are and will continue to ask. So I'd love just as a final question to ask what your vision for the future of reporting is and how quickly you think that's going to be realized. Janine, coming to you first. Sure, sure. Well, I'll say what I said in another event that Eric and I did recently, which is I just want people to be less confused. <laughs> I, I really would love to see a world where we've coalesced a lot of different communities around common language, common visuals, common understanding of the roles of the existing organizations. Uh, that would be fantastic. And then I think that the next step is really um, I do think the IFRS foundations, the logical home for global 
global standards oriented around enterprise value creation. I think that particularly because they have the public oversight, um, that that is the public interest oversight, which includes many of the securities regulators, that that's a path to globally consistent standards. And then I'd love to see globally consistent standards around the um, impact dimension, societal impact dimension. And I think GRI provides a really good foundation for that. Uh, and then I think that will always be supplemented by uh, regional or jurisdictional requirements that are oriented around specific public policy objectives. I think uh, Europe should could and should do that. I think the US could potentially do that. Uh, but I think if we could keep globally consistent, global consistency to the extent possible will collectively make more progress more rapidly. Eric. Yeah, no, so I would certainly agree. You know, if we can get to a, a common set of disclosures, uh, you know, with, with common definitions of, of what we're talking about and, and to the extent possible, even common metrics that can be used for a variety of purposes. You know, I think that's, uh, that's where we're really trying to drive, you know, specifically from a stakeholder perspective, you know, one of the things that 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 we're, we're keen to to undertake our discussions around well how do we how do we improve if you will the the oversight and and the public oversight of what gri is currently doing or, or some successful organization that's focused on the multi-stakeholder approach would do in the future you know to provide that additional legitimacy to what we're doing uh, i think we have a lot of legitimacy based on the thousands of companies that use us and the references that are made in a number of countries. But but I think there's always room for improvement. I think one of the benefits that the IFRS Foundation and, and Janine alluded to it earlier is that they have that intergovernmental support uh, and, and a intergovernmental oversight of that in the public, working in the public interest. I think if we can work on that mechanism, you know, from a sustainability uh, multi-stakeholder approach, I think would be a, would be a wonderful thing. And then work together, you know, with uh, those that are, are focused on the value creation, sustainability impacts and the societal impacts. I think, uh, you know, look, that'd be a, that'd be a home run. And, and how soon can we get there? You know, we can't get there soon enough uh, is the answer uh, because the world isn't getting any better in many respects. Yeah, absolutely. And certainly, Ashley and Alda in the in the the session just leading into this touched on some of that intergovernmental um, drive and that oversight that could be there. And next, we're going to be speaking to the investment community to really hear what they're looking for and how they're responding. So I'd like to thank both of you very much for sharing your thoughts. And um, we'll look forward to continued discussion in this area. We're doing webinars both with the IFRS Foundation and the European Commission. So I'm sure we'll hear direct from them um, whether their visions agree with yours. So thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you for having us. Thanks, Eric.